so Dr. Walter Sue, uh, thank you for uh, doing this webinar with us. Uh, Dr. Walter Sue is a board advisor for Physicians for National Health Program. Um, he's a past president of the American Public Health Association and served as the Public Health Commissioner. Uh, and he's done a lot of uh, work in this area of disparities as well as healthcare financing, um, in particular briefing members of Congress on healthcare issues. Um, so, uh, Dr. Sue, I'll turn this over to you. Well, thanks a lot, Matt, and thanks everyone for coming here today. And I, I, I want to start off by saying that I want to talk about health disparities and the social determinants of health. And um, my perspectives on this are different ways of looking at this than maybe other lectures that I've heard. So I thought I'd share some of this with all of you. Let's hope this, let's see if this goes forward. How come it's not going forward here? So some of you who uh, have studied healthy people uh, recognize this uh, graph. Uh, this is us. We are individuals. And when we are born as individuals, let me see. Uh, we're endowed by our parents with certain genetic biology that in many ways helps determine our health in the future. And of course, we also engage in behaviors, and sometimes those are good behaviors and sometimes they're not good. Some of those behaviors are dictated or influenced by our social environment that we're in. And um, the crowd we hang out with and who we've going to school with, et cetera, help influence some of those behaviors. And of course, the physical environment that we grow up in, where our homes are located, um, whether we actually have um, uh, a clean environment that we live in, those things can also affect our health. And then importantly, of course, is access to quality health care. And this is where the uh, issues of single payer actually are quite dominant. And you'll notice that in Healthy People 2010, they chose to make access to health quality health care a key and fundamental basic determinant of health. So I think our emphasis on trying to get access to everybody is, um, is an essential part if we are actually to improve the social determinants of health. And then Finally, the policies and interventions that are created on our behalf are, are essential. So if those policies actually discriminate against a certain group of individuals, let's say uh, the LGBT community or uh, African Americans, and that they have a different set of rules from other people, then um, what we discover, of course, is those policies, whether they're intentional or not, can affect their health. So all these areas are essential for us to fully understand what goes into becoming a healthy individual. Um, in many ways, the social environment that we grow up in um, are things that we traditionally think of as part of the social determinants of health. So nutritious foods, the housing stock, the opportunities for good jobs, which in part is related to our opportunities to get a good education. And increasingly in our society today, the digital divide is an important tool for us to help um, address the social determinants of health. So technology is important. Our access to transportation services, public safety and crime. What kind of social supports are available to you and your family members? And what are we doing about trying to lift people out of poverty and assure that they don't, they don't spend all their time um, thinking of surviving as their first priority, that they have an opportunity actually to engage in some of these other parts 
of the social environment. And then English as a second language is something that many of us don't fully appreciate until you're in that situation. But language and culture is an essential part of your of, a, of understanding um, getting access to social determinants of health. So these things like the national class standards, the cultural and linguistic standards that healthcare facilities and other groups have to engage in are an essential part of improving health. Then the physical environment is also very important and that includes the natural environment that we're, we grow up in. So if you live in Sedona, Arizona, you live in this beautiful natural environment with lots of um, beautiful scenery. But if you also live in maybe the inner city of Camden, New Jersey, you might find that that's a very different environment that you live in. Uh, if you live right along the shore, you might think that's a great place to live, but actually with climate change coming, it may increasingly become ones where it's much more difficult. So uh, the natural environment does dictate that, and uh, people in California, unfortunately, are experiencing that right now. Uh, the built environment is also very important. Uh, where we locate our buildings, our sidewalks, whether we have bike lanes and roads, are ways in which we can help improve the physical environment, where we actually work, learn, and play. Otherwise, work sites, our schools, and recreational settings also are important to our health. Whether we have housing located in areas that are walkable and bikeable are very important. Um, housing stock um, located on brown fields has a different implication for health than those that are built on um, on natural unspoiled lands. And then your exposure to, to toxic substances is also something that can affect your health. And those physical barriers, such as having curb cuts in cities, or um, other barriers that are set up, particularly those with disabilities and have mobility problems, can also affect your health. And of course, the aesthetic things, good city planning, good lighting, locations of trees, benches for people to sit on, all that actually helps create maybe more social capital and makes it a much more livable place or desirable place to live. So in, sense, in a sense, place does matter. If the no hypothesis would be that it really, that life expectancy really, it doesn't matter where you live, that everybody basically lives the same length of time, this map dispels that notion. So for example, if you see here, areas in the south, south actually find that they actually have shorter life expectancies than their neighboring states in the north, like in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And uh, I show here a map of Pennsylvania, and um, in my personal career, I've served as the health officer for Montgomery County, which is a suburban county right outside of Philadelphia, and also as health commissioner of Philadelphia. And what's striking is that Montgomery County is the second wealthiest county in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia is the poorest county. So I've been in both extremes and it's just a few miles from each other. But it also affects your life expectancy so that in Montgomery County, your life expectancy is seven years more than if you live in Philadelphia. And it's literally right across the border from each other. And the question, of course, that is raised is why is that? Why is it that there are differences, maybe seven years in differences in life expectancy, that just for literally a few yards difference across a common border with the city of Philadelphia? And uh, I think that's something for us to think about. 
No, it's not just being thought about at the local level. It's actually a world phenomena. So some of you who study global health know about the Millennium Development Goals established in the year 2000. They were 15-year goals to um, actually help achieve a better health status, uh, particularly for developing countries worldwide. But uh, there were eight of these goals, and they expired this year, 2015. And uh, not surprisingly, there's now an effort to create new goals, which are referred to as the Sustainable Development Goals. And some of you may know that last weekend, the Pope, the President, Vladimir Putin, all the leaders of the world came to the United Nations to talk about things. And one of the key things that, or key goals of that UN conference was the establishment and adoption of 17 sustainable development goals. Now, some people might say that this list is too long and very much pie in the sky. And we're committing ourselves for another 15 years to the next the year 2030 to do goals like universal health care. Boy, wouldn't that be something for our country? And then also, and also uh, ending poverty, ending hunger, healthy living, uh, equitable education, gender equality, water and sanitation, sustainable energy, full employment, infrastructure development, reducing inequalities, making cities safe and sustainable, sustainable consumption, climate change, respect oceans and seas, forest and land conservation, peace and justice for all, and global partnership. Well, these 17 goals, you know, in some respects, it's kind of like mom and apple pie. They're very laudable. How much we're going to actually achieve is another question. But these goals are very much uh, essential to the type of goals that we would consider part of the social determinants of health. And just five days ago, we as a nation adopt uh, as the world adopted these sustainable development goals. So uh, it's worth looking at what the WHO says are social determinants of health, and they are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. And these forces and systems include economic policies, and systems, development agendas, social norms, social policies, and political systems. Now, I would dare say that if you were to read that to most of your neighbors and friends, their eyes would glaze over because they have no idea what you're talking about. So the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, actually, has commissioned a group of political minds to think about how to talk about social determinants of health in a more layperson-friendly way. And I share them with you. These are six ways in which they suggested we could talk about them. But they are easier for us maybe to digest. Things like health starts long before illness in our homes, schools, and jobs. Or health begins where we live, learn, work, and play. So here we capture the idea that housing, education, our work sites, our recreation sites, the communities we live in, all of that contributes to our health. And it's an important concept, I think, for us as we go out there and talk about social determinants of health because, frankly, it's a mouthful, but people are much more prone to understand when you can, we can put this in the context of, of their everyday lives. Now, Drew Weston, who wrote this book called The Political Brain, was one of the consultants on this RWJ study. And he did survey Republicans about how they look at the term social determinants of health and found that 
to my consternation, I'm sure many of you on this call, find that the term equality in health very alienating. Uh, that um, they were much more supportive of the concept of, quote, fairness and health choices. So what does that mean in terms of how we might think about the single-payer framing? Well, for re many Republicans, it means, I think, that single-payer uh, and social health is about choices for the poor and in choosing doctors and hospitals. It allows them to make their own individual decisions. So if we had single payer, you actually all empower the poor, if you will, to choose any number of doctors and hospitals and that they can then be empowered to make their own decisions. That type of language go, is actually much more attractive to conservatives who are trying to uh, put their hands around the concept of social determinants of health. Another important idea is to think about how this might be applicable to our own communities. So, for example, you could ask any number of questions. Why is a, a pro so-and-so a problem in my community? So you can, as an example, you can pick heroin. Why is heroin a problem in my community? And to do that, there are two questions you can ask. One is called the but why technique try to find the root causes. So why, but why is heroin a problem in my community? Well, it's maybe because we don't have enough uh, drug treatment programs, or maybe because prescription drugs for opiates are so expensive and heroin has gotten so cheap that it's actually a cheaper alternative for people who are seeking a pain relief. Or maybe any number of other factors, but the but why technique could be one of the ways in which we can help drill down to find a root cause of care. And then finally, what could we do to have prevented this? So could we actually have maybe different uh, uh, things like having drug treatment programs in our communities, or could we have do something more about uh, the price of prescription drugs, or can we do something more about a whole host of other things about educating people about the dangers of heroin use, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's, the point here is that by asking the questions for each of our communities, we can come up with maybe more creative answers that go to the root causes as to why this is a problem in our communities. One of the things that Healthy People 2020 discovered in their examination of social determinants of health is that we're, there were th three overarching factors that seemed to come up repeatedly. One of them was to lower the income inequality. That seemed to be an important part of improving health and one that many advocates, particularly li those of us who are liberal and progressive, embraced. But I might add that the other two, higher social connectiveness, is something that I think has bipartisan support. We all want to live in communities where we feel like we know our neighbors, that we feel like we're wanted to, and, and, and people feel like they want to be there. And also, we want to have some better control of, over our own lives, our own destinies in some way. That's something that I think that also has bipartisan support. The interesting thing about single-payer health care, I think, is that it offers us the benefits of all three factors. So in financing single-payer, it is not surprising that it's one of the ways in which we can actually lower the huge disparity between the rich and the poor. And then also, one of the prides of many countries that helps define their country is the fact that they all, rich and poor, young and old, black and white, all share in the same healthcare system. There's a social connectedness to that, and I think that's some, one of the advantages that single payer could also offer us. And finally, of course, if you have freedom to choose whatever doctor or hospital you want, and you could do it without worrying about your medical bills, you do have higher control over your one's life. 
So all the aspects that we fight for single payer framed in a different language, I think, have elements that intuitively will improve the health status of Americans. Now, a uniquely American term, one that is not shared in other countries by and large, is the concept of health disparities. So, for example, if you, when I was in Toronto, I asked the Toronto Health Commissioner, what is your black infant mortality rate? And she looked at me and she said, I have no idea because we don't measure that. Because in other countries, this concept that a racial or ethnic differences in the quality of health care that are not due to access related factors or clinical needs, preferences, or appropriateness of interventions. Uh, that's kind of an IOM definition of health disparities. Uh, one that I think is a little bit easier for me to understand is one that Fox Chase Cancer Center, my friends over there, have used, which is inequalities that exist when members of certain population groups do not benefit from the same health status as other groups. So in the uh, concept of health disparities is the fact that minorities and non-minorities have differences. And those differences ha has been broken down into three different parts. So it could be that it is more clinically appropriate to provide some medicines for African Americans because it works better or works or maybe avoid medicines because it doesn't work that well in African Americans. Uh, hypertension treatments has something that I've heard about in the past. Or maybe there are patient preferences in terms of um, things like maybe many minorities don't prefer breastfeeding over bottle feeding as an example. Those are differences but are, are not considered disparities. What disparities relate to, however, are those parts of the differences where the operation of the healthcare system and the legal and regulatory climate actually discriminates against a, uh, a group. So, for example, um, we might consider institutional racism an example of where we could have um, just differences between a one health system and uh, uh, how the health system might attract, approach different racial groups. And there may be overt discrimination that's happening out there. There's actual biases that actually we might be able to measure and look at, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So looking at this all came together in an IOM report that's sort of a classic called Unequal Treatment confronting racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. And their statement is that there is a significant body of evidence that has identified disparities in healthcare. Now in my younger days when I was the health commissioner of Philadelphia, one of the most vexing things that I was faced with was this infant mortality question. And unlike Canada, the United States, we do measure differences uh, by, by different races. And one of the things that's perhaps most disturbing is that the black infant mortality rate in Philadelphia was 250% higher than that of the white infant mortality rate. So the black infant mortality rate in your screen is red, and the white infant mortality rate is in blue. And the question is, why is that? I mean, we have all these incredible health facilities. We train some of the best OBGYN docs and pediatricians in the world. We have Children's Hospital, one of the best children's hospitals in the world. And yet we have these enormous infant mortality differences. And there's also, of course, late and no prenatal care that we can see there that are different between black moms and white moms. And black moms are just much less likely to get necessary prenatal care. So this question is not just true in Philadelphia, but the disparity is actually seen nationwide. And we can see that for a country as wealthy as we are, 
that the chances of a black baby reaching its first ba birth uh, birthday is significantly uh, worse than that of a white baby, even though we have all these uh, wonderful health facilities. And what's also striking is that it's really not narrowing that over the course of the five years that I show you here, the differences between the red line and the black line has really not narrowed at all, and that's really also quite disturbing. Here's another thing that was kind of an eye-opener that I mentioned something about discrimination earlier. This is a classic study that Kevin Shulman and his colleagues did where they basically told, showed a movie, a story, uh, and they had heart symptoms. These are patients with heart symptoms and they brought it to a group of internists at a convention and they asked them, what kind of therapies would you recommend for these patients? And the only difference between one set of movies and the other set of movies was the color of their skin. And what they found, published in the New England Journal, is that for the vast majority of doctors, it really made no difference. They made their recommendation. They made the recommendations for things like cardiac catheterization, regardless of whether they were black or white. But for one category, actually, the black females who were elderly, there was a significant difference, and they were much less likely to recommend cardiac catheterization for elderly, elderly black women. And the question was raised in this article as to why would that be? And even though we would like to think that as providers we don't really try to discriminate, it's pretty clear that there are providers who do discriminate based perhaps on the color of skin. There's another area that I am interested in in public health that actually offers, I think, a lesson in health disparities, and that is vaccinations or immunizations, because immunizations is something that we recommend for everybody. And one of the striking areas is hepatitis B, because I'm interested because I'm an Asian American, and as many of you know, hepatitis B is much more prevalent among Asian Americans. But with the advent of hepatitis B vaccine in America and the recommendation that it be given universally, and in fact it's the first shot that's given actually at birth in the hospital, uh, we see actually a dramatic reduction in acute hepatitis B infections across the United States, such that by 2008, the Asian American hepatitis B incidence is exactly the same as the rest of the general population. And that's due in no small measure to the fact that we have this universal hepatitis B vaccine. So what is the lesson that we learn here? One is that if we want to work on health disparities, we have to start young. And the second is that policies that are truly universal, that everyone gets access to these services, that there are consistent rules for everyone, those things are important ways in which we can help eliminate disparities. And I point that out because one of the virtues, not surprisingly, of single payer is that it has those concepts inherent in the very concept of single payer. Now, I mentioned to you that infant mortality was a troubling issue for me as health commissioner, and I wanted to see if there were other areas in which infant mortality was not actually being not such a big problem. And to my great surprise, I found this article in, uh, that was published at the Madigan Army Medical Center up in Washington, where they actually tracked black and white infant mortality and found that the difference was not 250% different, it was 22% difference. Now, this article has gotten virtually no publicity at all, but, but the point here is that I think it, um, you know, it illustrates that we can do something even here in America about reducing infant mortality. So what lessons can we learn from this? Well, one is that if we have guaranteed access to health care, which is true for an Army Medical Center, 
and if people have higher education and income, which is also true for people who attend the Army Medical Center because they're all employed through the Army, um, you can actually do something about reducing infant mortality. In fact, this led me to think a little bit more about the military, and even though I'm not a great fan of the military, most progressives are usually critics, there is one area that I think the military does much better than, than the general population, and that's in their ability to create a healthcare system for their, uh, for their military and for their veterans. So here's a study that uh, Tsai and her colleagues did, which showed that the use of the VA healthcare system was not associated with race. It was associated with VA disability or lack of private insurance or greater health care need. But in contrast, for those who don't use the VA, that is to say the rest of us, the veterans who were racial minorities, less educated and without private health insurance, were less likely to avail themselves of services. That is to say, by having or establishing a universal health care system for veterans who are service connected, they actually were able to then show that race was not a factor in admissions that all the people could get access to services. Here's an intriguing question that was raised that I think deserves a study that should have been done a long time ago. And it was published in the Green Journal. And that question is, are there counties in the United States where actually the black male mortality rate is either equal or less than that of the white male mortality rate? Because if there are counties that are doing a better job of, of not having disparities, then we want to learn about what are they doing and what are they doing right and what can we learn from that? So this Green Journal study I thought was interesting because actually of the 1,307 counties where black infant mortality rates could, were high enough that they could actually classify them, there were 66 of them out of the whole country where black men had actually lower mortality than that of white men. And the most interesting aspect that characterized those 66 counties, that 97% of those counties were home to or adjacent to a military installation. Now that's pretty amazing. In blacks in these counties had less poverty, higher percentages of elderly civilian veterans, and higher per capita income. So that within these counties, the black-white mortality difference was eliminated, and it was eliminated for not just infant mortality issues, but ischemic heart disease, accidents, liver disease, COPD, and mental disorders from drug use. So I think actually one of the things that we discover here is that in these counties, these 66 counties, on average, they were statistically more significant to have higher income, uh, less people in poverty, more likely to have graduated high school, and um, a higher percentage of them were veterans. Uh, that is to say, many of the counties illustrate those social determinants of health that we have acknowledged are important, in fact, essential for helping us improve health. Better income, better, uh, less people in poverty, better education, as all that is helpful in trying to reduce black uh, male mortality. There are many other studies that I don't have time to go into, but they include things where they've been able to show no disparities now for racial groups in things like surveillance mammography, colon cancer survival, lung cancer survival, pediatric asthma, and oral health in those who avail themselves of these military facilities. And the most recent study about all this just came out just uh, seven days ago. So I share it share with you because I think it's also worth looking at. Because not only are there situations where we do a better job for black mortality, we actually do such a good job 
that the black mortality rate is even better than that of the white mortality rate. And where is that? It's the VA. The VA in this article in the LA Times shows that they actually do, that uh, blacks actually did better than whites in terms of mortality. And this study is not just a small, you know, 100 people cohort study, because I want to share with you the numbers here. We're starting with 547,000 black patients. We're talking about 2.5 million white patients followed for nine years. And what did we find after nine years? This huge cohort, white mortality rate was 32, the black mortality rate was 22.5 per thousand. That is to say, blacks did better than whites. And to top, to put the icing on the cake, cake the authors followed a group of 5,000 people who they got from the NHANES study, which some of you know is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. It is a national randomized controlled study that is done annually in this country that measures the health and nutrition status of Americans. And for that group of people followed for nine years, the black mortality rate was 42% higher than the white. That is to say, it is what we have come to expect in America, that black, blacks have a higher mortality rate than whites. But amazingly, if you look at what happened in the VA system, the blacks actually do better than that of the whites, which only illustrates that we are capable in this country of actually eliminating health disparities given the right situation and circumstances. Now, I want to move on to what I think is the next big civil rights issue for the 21st century, and it starts with this pyramid. This is the population pyramid of the United States of America. And back in 1900, you can see if you were to plot the number of females in blue and the number of males in green, and you did it by five-year age increments for each year, not surprisingly, back in 1900, we had a lot of young people, and as you get older, you die off, and it sort of tapers off to the top. By 1950, the number of young people has started to actually narrow, particularly in the teenage years. And by the year 2000, we no longer have a true population pyramid anymore. What we have looks maybe more like a Coke bottle or something like that. But the point here is that we just have lost a whole generation of young people. And the larger social economic implications of not having enough young people in our labor force, in funding our Social Security and Medicare programs, any number of things have profound factors and influence on this country. So the question is, where are our young people nowadays? What could we do as policies to help change that? We could incentivize couples to have more babies. That is unlikely to happen. But immigration turns out to be maybe the fastest and most obvious way of changing and improving or increasing the labor pool of our, of our country. But what are we doing as a country in terms of our immigration rules for health care? We deny legal immigrants to this country for the first five years of getting Medicaid services. And we, by statute, say that if you're an undocumented immigrant, even with your own money, you may not purchase health insurance on the health insurance exchange under the Affordable Care Act. That is to say, we make it very, very difficult for, Im for immigrants to actually get health services in our country at a very time when I think our labor pool is going to increasingly rely on and and, and require us to think about how we do immigration services. So in the end, what I really want to talk about is that we are capable in this country of eliminating health disparities. And there are some important lessons that I think we can learn from the few examples that I've shown here. One is that programs have to be universal and that we have to start when they're young. 
we have to believe that everyone in this country can succeed. Then we have to offer job opportunities and educational opportunities to everyone, which is one of the reasons why public education is such a pillar, I think, of the social determinants for health. When I was health commissioner, and I don't know if it's true in your state, but in Pennsylvania, uh, under the health department, we have an office of health equity. And its mission is to actually look at health disparities. And it has maybe two or three people who work in this office of health equity, which in my mind is window dressing. It's basically saying that, we're, let's sort of say we're doing something about health disparities. Let's ha create this office of health equity. Let's put two or three people in there. And then let's put it buried within the health department so that nobody knows that it exists. The truth is, is that if you really want to do something about the social determinants of health, things like housing, education, transportation, et cetera, et cetera, you're talking about a national effort. It has to be the top priority of the highest elected official. It has to be what the government is all about. It's one of the reasons why more enlightened governments are talking about health in all policies. There's a health component to transportation. There's a health component to housing. The health component to education. All of this has to be embraced by us if we want to do something about social determinants health. It doesn't matter if you're the mayor or, for that matter, if you're the president of the United States. In fact, someday my hope is that the president, whoever that he or she may be, will stand in front of Congress someday at the State of the Union address and say that the domestic agenda for my administration is the elimination of health disparities. Because then that person understands that to eliminate health disparities means you have to put health in all policies. And if you want to do eliminate health uh, disparities and uh, do something about that, you have to do something about the social determinants determinants of health, which should be the mission of what government is all about. So in the end, we're going to fight a lot of sacred cows. We're going to invest in the very young. We're going to fully fund public education. We're going to create our jobs not based on who you know, but what you know. We have to do something about wealth and inequality in this country. We have to do something that's unthinkable, tax the rich and give it to the poor. We have to live in a society which is truly colorblind, where people say to me, I have no idea what the black infant mortality rate because that's not what we measure anymore. We actually look at all infant mortality in this country. We have to think about immigration reform. And yes, we'd have to think about how we create a path for citizenship for those who are undocumented. And here's another sacred cow that we uh, find difficult to do single-payer national health insurance for all the reasons that I talked about. It's the foundation upon which people can get, uh, 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 get access to health care, and it's essential for us to eliminate health disparities. Because if we want to do that, we have to actually celebrate the diversity that is in our country. That is the best way in which we can be best address the social determinants of health. Thank you. That's my talk. So I'm happy um, to answer any questions, and I see that um, the first question is, will this be on the PNHP website? And Matt says it will be. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question, Walter. Yeah. Um, so this is Ida Hellander. I wanted to say I really enjoyed your talk. I love. I really enjoyed learning about the. Um, the uh, lack of uh, health disparities around military sites, mm -hmm. and um, and that study in which the counties they found counties <clears throat> where the um, black life expectancy was longer than white life expectancy, and your example about the hepatitis B vaccine eliminating the disparity in um, hepatitis B infection rates in Asians, yeah. and I was wondering if there were some other examples like that that you wanted to put into your slides but just thought it would be, you know, you didn't have time for it or 
because you said there were some other examples like in mammography, in um, colon cancer treatment. Um, so I thought if we just had a minute you might mention another specific instance because I thought those were so fascinating. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think um, I don't. I didn't actually prepare um, enough for those other studies to um, exam to you know give a presentation. But I what I I really wanted to say is that uh, the military actually has a lot of examples within their bases where uh, because they don't illustrate discrimination in who gets access to their services. Um, they are able to to write papers on a, a range of of services where their statistics are uh, are better than that of of our general population. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the interesting secrets also is most people are, are familiar with the VA um, Vista system, or I think it's now blue button or something. But anyway, their electronic health record is truly universal. And it's integrated with both their radiology and so on. So all their lab tests and other services for patients um, are available to everybody. And I think that goes a long way to for the for the physicians who are taking care of patients to really see the patients um, for the illnesses that they are treating and not based on maybe the color of their skin or um, you know their VA their disability status is much more important mm -hmm. so for a lot of reasons I think that we could do a lot better job in this country well and everybody would have the same insurance status yes. going to the VA yeah. right. um, so I have uh, a question that is thought-provoking talk. I'm wondering if you really think that ethnicity-blind collection of data will really be feasible and appropriate for any country. I understand that, for example, the level of urban malaise related to housing schooling is greater in France where these data are not collected and therefore specifically addressed where they are. This may not be causal of course, but it, if you don't have data, then you don't know there is a problem. Well, that's a very good point. Actually, uh, I uh, actually work a lot with the Asian and Pacific Islander Health Forum, which is specifically looking at health status. And our biggest complaint is actually lumping all Asians together in one big group uh, that actually disaggregating the data actually shows much more of the disparities instead of us looking just like the model minority. Uh, so your point is something that I think is is valid, and unless you really look for this, sometimes you will miss the disparities that are that are out there. Um, I think um, in in the ideal, we will actually have a society where everyone has universal access. And until we actually can talk about that, I don't think we should ever eliminate collecting data based on race or uh, different other groups so that we can identify those disparities. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the language of health equity and its negative connotations for Republicans? Well, I mean, I think one of the concerns was that health equality as a term, somehow or another, uh, is a visceral reaction for many Republicans. The concept that maybe if you do health equality, then you're just taking money from us to give to them, rather than thinking about um, using the term health equality. I think what I'm trying to get to is, uh, even though I am happy to believe in health equality, um, recognize that some people have a visceral reaction against it and that maybe what we should do is let's give as a given a single-payer universal health care system then we actually use that as a way of empowering individual decision-making on the parts of all people including African Americans and people who had traditionally been uninsured and by empowering them that is something that 
most people, including conservatives, can embrace as a concept. And I think one of the ways in which we can talk about single payer for conservatives. Um, how do you respond to people who for, uh, throughout the 2014 Minnesota Department of Health study that claimed to show access and clinical care only accounted for 10% of the determinants of health? Uh, I'm not uh, fully uh, familiar with the the study, so I perhaps don't know, but I can only say that um, access to care is an important part, but it's not the whole part of social determinants of health. And so I fully agree that sometimes education, housing, and uh, job opportunities may play a more important role in reducing infant mortality than just getting access to health care. So uh, there are, it's a uh, complicated issue, but all those areas around social determinants of health do contribute to improving our health. Uh, I'm a pre-med student at San Diego, and I mentor with the med students to expose them to concepts, young local high school students to concepts in your talk. Have you had experience educating high schoolers about these topics? And if so, what has been successful? Actually, I uh, I have a young teenage daughter, so I guess I lecture her a lot about um, um, things like social determinants of health. But I don't use the language of social determinants of health because she's the one whose eyes would glaze over if I say that. But I do think that, you know, the language that the Robert Johnson Foundation suggests where we talk about where we learn, live, work, and play, uh, that concept is something that teenagers can understand. And we can have a dialogue about how we can improve um, those areas. And then we can ask the students to think about how do you think that might make your health better if where we learned, lived, work, and played were actually better environments and they let them come up with some answers. I think that would be an interesting discussion. Um, finally, I guess as a Canadian, I have to say that universal access is far from eliminating disparities for those who are in the First Nations, for First Nations. So um, I agree. And uh, Canada, even though they have, you know, universal health care, they still show evidence where um, it's not equally, health care is not equal, equal even for those who are in the First Nations. And um, that's why we do have to be vigilant about um, looking at measuring how well people are getting access to services. So I do agree with that. Um, I think that's all the questions, so. <laughs> great, thank you everyone for all your questions. Um, and thank you, Walter, for this great presentation. Um, again, it will be posted to our website, uh, so we'll send out the link for that. Thank you. Thank you, Walter.